Hey musical scientists, welcome to the second episode of Science Life, the series where I try to have interesting conversations with interesting people about science, art, life, whatever. Today, hot on the heels of the release of my new video, More Than Birds, I have a special guest for you. Richard Prum is the William Robertson Co. Professor of Ornithology at Yale University. I reached out to him because he was one of my big inspirations and sources of material for this song, and he replied saying that he loved my work and that he'd love to be on the podcast. Our conversation went all over the place, from beauty to bird sex and feminism to dinosaurs to the need to take risks when you're pursuing science, and he's a fascinating presenter. You can see his eyes just light up when he's talking about his favorite subject. So I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation. If you're watching this on YouTube, two notes. One is that I'm releasing this as a podcast as well, which you can find by searching Science Life on iTunes or SoundCloud. The second is that unfortunately we had some technical glitches while filming this, and only about the first half hour of my camera here in the studio was recording. We still had the full conversation, but unfortunately, if you're watching this on YouTube, the second half, you'll only see Richard's lovely face. In any case, without further ado, I give you my conversation with Professor Richard Prom. We're the spice. We're the flavor of the universe. <laughs> All right, I'm here with Richard Prum, the William Robertson Co. Professor of Ornithology at Yale. Richard, thanks for uh, being on the show. My pleasure. Uh, exciting to be here. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great to see you in person. I did this latest song about birds pretty much based off one of your lectures on YouTube that I just stumbled across. Um, after seeing that and also the discovery of, of those incredible um, feathers in amber that were discovered, what, what was it, December? Mm -hmm. um, just sort mm -hmm. of burst my my curiosity for this entire world of birds. I think. Um, so, how did you get started on this? What was what was the inspiration so, for you? I I started uh, bird watching as a young kid, about ten years old. Uh, I actually got my first pair of glasses, <laughs> and before I had glasses, I was doing sort of amorphously nerdy things like uh, you know memorizing records from the Guinness Book of Records and and forcing my uh, siblings to to test me on them, you know, who was the fattest man, who has ate the most whelks in five minutes, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> and all of a sudden I got my glasses and, you know, something about the world came into focus. And the first thing within three months, I was a bird watcher. And uh, it started with a book, you know, sort of seeing a field guide. And I think immediately was the excitement of, of the hunt, you know, what you had to do and where you had to go to actually see these birds. Um, and the whole idea of adventure, uh, and the f idea that all these birds are real, they're really out there and, uh, something you could do, you could go look for them. So it started with bird watching and, uh, and, uh, basically now I'm many decades in and I've, uh, never considered any other, uh, line of work. <laughs> it. I'm, I'm basically a lifelong bird nut, uh, as I, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, birds are like, when you get into just the the variety of them like there's I think there's a reason why there's bird watching and there's really no other kind of watching right that has the same sort of place in the culture there's, well, there's something very special about birds I think right I I think so they're very visual and they're auditory so birds communicate themselves uh, in their daily lives uh, and in their courtship and uh, through the same sensory modalities that are really important to us right so so mm -hmm. you know mammals have this whole pheromone world that we're just most mammals that we're just cut off from. But the fact that we see in color and that we have really good hearing uh, means that uh, birds do a lot of things that are really kind of salient to us and we, we, we enjoy that, right? So they're, they're appealing. But a lot of tactile people like mice or bats <laughs> and, uh, and there are fish people and there's uh, bug people and but botanists, you know, uh, even, you know, mushroom fanatics. Uh, there's a lot of space for natural history uh, um, amazement. That's true. There are there are specializations for all of those, but it's true. I guess that, in a way, birds are more similar to people than people are to a lot of other animals. In, in a convergent way, and what's really interesting is that that even goes to the cognitive complexity in their brains. You know, hmm. bird birds have the most complex brains of of any non mammals, and it's convergent with mammals. And indeed, it, 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 there's a lot of cognitive uh, abilities that crows and parrots have. 
that are as advanced or more than 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 uh, than uh, than monkeys and even uh, even some apes. So so they're they're really uh, they're really amazing creatures. Right, and I suppose that 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 convergence you were talking about, where human beings for some reason have incredible sight and not great smell, where whereas most other mammals are. Or even mostly a smelling brain, like you talk in, about a dog, and it's indeed as we as we get up off the ground, you know, our noses aren't on the substrate anymore. Uh, we have lost a lot of smell capacity, a lot of olfact, and actually a lot of genes. The human genome is a lot smaller than the rat genome because we've lost a lot of olfactory genes, right? <laughs> you know, wow. so, yeah. So so, but but interestingly, uh, birds see much better than we do. Hmm. Um, uh, mammals in particular spent about a hundred million years running around in the dark trying to keep from being eaten by dinosaurs, right? And during that nocturnal period, our quite complicated color visual system degraded. So we don't really see as well as like a goldfish or a bird or a lizard. They have, or, or turtle even, they have really good color vision. You know, we see an RGB. Uh, red, green, blue, but birds see an RGB UV, ultraviolet. So they have a whole nother dimension to their color world, uh, which means they see colors like, you know, ultraviolet yellow, which is a mixture of two colors that are non-adjacent. So it's kind of like a special kind of purple. Purple right. is a mixture of, of red, and, red and blue. Uh, and so this ultraviolet yellow is as different from yellow as purple is from red. Uh, but we we can't see it at all, and they use it in their plumage. They use it in their daily life. So uh, you know, birds can see who's wearing sunblock, you know, on the beach. Uh, and, and, and so these kind of surprising things uh, expose us to the richness of their kind of sensory world. So so it's like mammals and birds, in some ways, at the beginning of their evolution, evolved. Like birds come from the very dinosaurs that were trying to eat us when it was daytime, and we evolved. Yeah. The sort of the complementary senses to avoid and, them and, when and, they weren't good at seeing. And mammals ended up filling a lot of the terrestrial niches that that uh, that were uh, left open when most of the dinosaurs went extinct, right? Uh, and even 30 million years ago, there were these big, what they call terror birds, big sort of terrestrial, you know, killer birds uh, with no wings and big beaks, uh, but they were all replaced by carnivores, uh, which became, you know, the big... Uh, terrestrial predators. Okay, so maybe can you walk me through a little bit of the process of, like, how did we make this breakthrough to to understanding and pretty much accepting now that birds are in fact dinosaurs? Because this isn't that old of a find, is it? Right, right. Um, you know, interestingly, it, it's a combination of the two classic uh, influences in science. The first are discovery of, of new information, new fossils, right? Hmm. And the other was a change in how we think about uh, evolution, how we reconstruct the past, right? Um, uh, so in the old days, uh, throughout most of the 20th century, the main goal of classification, you know, the science of taxonomy, how we group organisms together, um, was to create essentially a useful filing system. Uh, it was uh, as much to reflect the human mind and its uh, usefulness uh, as it was to reflect uh, evolutionary history. And so then in, in the late 20th century, people got very interested in phylogenetics, which is the science of actually reconstructing the tree of life. You know, trying to figure out who's related to who and when those branches diverged in time. Uh, the science became very molecular and, and very exciting. Um, but, the, but, the, but that shift um, led to a, 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 an attempt to discover exactly the relationships of, of birds. Hmm. Um, and people started to look at old evidence in new ways and also to new discoveries. Um, the first thing came with Deinonychus, which is, uh, you know, uh, one of the, the best known early raptor dinosaurs. Uh, and it was described by John Ostrom uh, here at Yale in the 70s. And he started to realize, wait a minute, this very derived theropod dinosaur, meat eater with a killer claw, closely related to Velociraptor that chased the kids around the kitchen in Jurassic Park, right, uh, had wrist bones and finger bones. That were extremely like Archaeopteryx, Lithographica, which is the 
canonical bird fossil. It's the, 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 the original bird, if you will. Uh, feathers uh, on its wings and a long bony tail, a mixture of reptile and, and bird characters. So he really started it. And then a lot of people started analyzing the question using phylogenetics. Uh, and there was a big debate, uh, mostly between people who uh, wanted uh, uh, the traditional classification to stand and others who were interested in the new methods. Hmm. Uh, the most exciting finds, though, happened in, starting in the late 1990s, 98, 99, and early 2000s. This explosion of new fossils being discovered in Liaoning, China, an area of the world that had been not exposed to paleontology or science for many decades. Uh, and um, these uh, uh, early Cretaceous, late Jurassic deposits yielded an unbelievable number of early uh, birds and theropod dinosaurs that were very closely related to birds. Uh, and that led to uh, uh, the end of the debate because there were just so much new data uh, to support this. And, and basically, sort of the smoking gun, the last, uh, the last issue was feathers. Uh, and out of the Yanning, we discovered a bunch of, um, of feathered dinosaurs. So that really nailed it down that, that birds are living dinosaurs. Right. That's the feathers is the one that really captures the imaginations of people, right? To say that like, man, T-Rex had weird downy feathers or Velociraptor was actually this strange winged beast. Um, well, you know, the, what's, what's fascinating is that uh, we're learning both that, uh, that almost every aspect of bird biology is informed by dinosaur biology, hmm. right? That, 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 um, that birds are much more dinosaurian than we ever realized. And, and the flip side is that uh, those dinosaurs we thought we understood and thought we knew well turn out to be a lot more birdy than we ever imagined. Uh, so, so this, uh, this, uh, uh, it's now bird biology and dinosaur biology are just completely integrated now. So, what are the other strange overlaps that you might not expect between birds and dinosaurs? Well, really interestingly, uh, one of the uh, uh, great. Uh, 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 examples is this dinosaur called Oviraptor. And Oviraptor is, you know, bipedal, has this weird kind of beak uh, thing and a crest on its head. Uh, and it was described from Mongolia in the 1920s and 30s, and it was called Oviraptor or egg thief because it was captured, it was fossilized right at a nest. And uh, the, 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 the describer said it was fossilized in the very act of seizing uh, a, a clutch of eggs and obviously it was going to eat them. Um, and then in the 1990s, um, new fossils from Mongolia were, were gathered, and it was discovered that Oviraptor was actually brooding the eggs. These were its eggs. It was ah. taking care of them, right? So it, it wasn't thieving. It was, it, was, uh, it was a kind of, it was a parental care. Now, I lectured on this for 10 years as this is the mother, right, taking care of her eggs. And first we had projected onto dinosaurs that they were uh, lowly thieves, you know, that they were right. just, you know, either. And, then, and then we projected onto them that they were good moms, right, that they were taking care of the eggs. Well, recently, uh, David Verricchio at Montana State University and, and collaborators um, have established, uh, looking at the leg bones of these nesting dinosaurs, uh, that they're not the moms, they're the dads. And the reason we know this is because birds... Uh, and dinosaurs, female birds and dinosaurs, store this special kind of bone called medullary bone. It's a spongy bone in their long bones. And they put it in there so that they can capture or grab calcium quickly to, to make a bunch of eggs, hmm. right? To make eggshells. So a big bird will have medullary bone and a big dino, medullary bone in the, in the long bones of the leg, the femur and maybe uh, others. And so, but these guys didn't have any medullary bone. Hmm. So that meant that these were the dads. Um, which is fascinating, and and that lined up with this whole idea. When you look at a a bird, when you look at a dinosaur clutch of these 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 uh, these truodontids and oviraptor and company, the eggs are often paired. It looks like two eggs, then two eggs, and two eggs, and two eggs. You can easily find images of these nests. Um, it really looked like wow, you know, unlike a crocodile or a, or a turtle where they're just laying all their eggs at once blah, 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 right into a nest it literally looked like dinosaurs were laying a couple eggs then a couple then a couple over time right 
Uh, and that's interesting because a bird does that. A bird will lay one egg a day and then start to incubate them at the end when the clutch is completed, right? So, so um, uh, to make a long story short, we have discovered that it's very likely that these nests were housed or were cared for by males and that the clutches were laid by different females. So a female would come to one male, probably copulate, then lay a pair of eggs in his nest, then leave, and another female would come, and it was like his nest. This is fascinating uh. because this is the breeding system of the ostriches, emus, and tinamous, uh, these, this, uh, the, the, the most basal branch in the phylogeny of living birds. So this kind of dinosaur breeding biology is happening today in cassowary and emu and rhea and tinamou, these big, uh, mostly flightless birds. So um, it really looks like that. That was that was thought to be a weird bird thing. Now we find out that this aspect of living birds is probably an extant kind of dinosaur breeding biology. So that's an example of something you never would have expected about bird biology to be directly related to findings in uh, in, in, in 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 dinosaurs. Okay, so the so the female will go to one guy's nest and they'll mm -hmm. mate, and she'll she'll stick around there until she lays an egg, and then just run off and. And leave right. them to care. So it's like the and complete the, opposite the male, of what you see a lot of the time. The, care, the male cares for the eggs. Uh, what we know from a few of these species uh, today is that the male is caring for these young or these nests, and, and he does all the parental care, right? Uh, females are just out of the picture. The, the male cares for the young, and actually a lot of times they're not even his. Uh, um, wow. They might be some previous male, right? But then he has a chance that his eggs are going to be laid in another, in another nest. So if there's high predation, right, there's a l high risk of your nest getting eaten, it kind of benefits everybody to have a few eggs in this nest and a few eggs in that nest. So females have their eggs in multiple nests, and so do males, even though they're, they're the ones doing the caring. It's like bird communism. Well, <laughs> it's a, it, you know, uh, that really happens like, you know, the, uh, the, um, the commune in Vermont, right? Where you, but that's usually when you have one nest with multiple males and females all laying eggs in the same nest. Okay. But that's another story. This is more like a paying it forward sort of thing. Like you'll, right, right. you'll it's, care it's, for that guy's it's, eggs if that guy cares for yours. It, it's, a bet, it's a bet hedging uh, <laughs> strategy, but it's all based on male care, which is common in fishes, right? Hmm. Uh, but rare in, in, in other birds. Right. I suppose with, uh, with penguins being the other well-known exception that everybody loves, at least with the, with the eggs, right? Um, yeah, yeah. The, the, the vast majority of birds are, have uh, two parents at the nest, right? So hmm. uh, mom and dad are both caring for those offspring. In some cases, they're what we call socially monogamous, right? That is, they, they make a pair, they have a family, they raise the young, uh, but they may be copulating multiply with other individuals, and so some of the eggs in the nest may not be, may not be theirs as well. All right, so... Um... So that sort of goes into your other fascination that I've read about, which is beauty and like aesthetics for males and females, right? So, sure, sure. Um, which do you think came first? Is it that is it that the the visual system evolves for other reasons and then it becomes highly attuned to to beautiful things, or is it that it you sort of get this runaway where desiring beautiful things leads to a more more and more intense visual system? Which one comes first? Well, it, 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 it you know in this we have we really have great. Great data. It turns out that the visual system comes way before. Okay. And and it turns uh, this four color visual system RGB UV that that birds have um, uh, evolved in bony fishes. You know, it's part of our inner fish. It happened in the water. Actually, a huge amount of the innovations in in in, in vision usually occur in the water. Whether you're a scallop or a, a vertebrate, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the water seems to be this place where, where vision gets really important and a lot of innovations happen. So then when, when vertebrates came onto the land, they had this really cooking visual system, uh, which they kept. Uh, and it became really good for ecology for all sorts of reasons. And if you're not a nocturnal lineage you, you, and you're a vertebrate, you have a, pretty good, you have a pretty good vision. But then this bottleneck occurred in mammals where our visual system got really bad. But then it was cobbled together in a new way in, in old world monkeys. Our old world monkey ancestors had a, uh, a, 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 an innovation that gave us restored, at least trichromatic vision hmm. to us. But it's kind of a, it's a, it's, it's a bad version uh, compared to what birds have. Another innovation in terms of these oil droplet 
filters. They have special filters in their retinas that allow them to uh, s resolve colors much better. This happened in, in an ancestor probably of turtles and, and birds and crocodiles back in an early archosaurs plus turtles uh, group. So uh, could have happened in the water as well. Uh, um, but so bird vision came first. And then with all the social opportunity and social complexity, then, then, then all sorts of uh, opportunity for display and, uh, and other forms of beauty uh, uh, evolve. Okay, so, so how far back does that go then, the, these beauty displays? Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, uh, the, two, the two kinds of selection that can give rise to, to, to beautiful ornaments are uh, just social selection, right? Uh, who do you hang out with, right? Uh, and, and why, hmm. right? And those kind of social choices give rise to uh, ornaments that can be monogamous. Like a lot of parrots have bright colors, right? But they... They're monogamous and they're and they're uh, and they're uh, monomorphic. That is, males and females look the same, right? right. But there are also uh, uh, opportunities for sexual selection or mate choice, and, and these kind of choices give rise to really uh, uh, a dramatic ornament, like we see in Birds of Paradise or uh, or uh, you know uh, 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 the peacock's tail and all this kind of all this kind of thing. Is it also that you need sort of a certain complexity of of like brain processing power for beauty? Well, you know, um, what you really need is, um, you know, sensory biology. You need to be able to sense it. You need at least enough cognitive power to evaluate your choices. Uh, and then you need the, uh, the capacity, either social or cognitive, to, to make a choice. Um, so we usually think of these things as pretty advanced features. Hmm. Uh, but I would argue that bees are making choices when they forage on flowers. One reason why flowers are beautiful is because every flower is trying to be memorably rewarding uh, to the bee, right? <laughs> it's like if you look at a Coke can, uh, there's nothing on the outside that tells you anything about what's inside, right? right? It's only a, 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 an abstract symbol of, that's trying to remind you of the experience of the last time you had it, right? Well, flowers are like that too. Um, to a flower or to a bee, a flower has architecture, Right. And it's like it's a whole, you know, you're inside of it. Right. And it's uh, it's uh, got this incredible overpowering odor and all this food. And um, and so the flower is trying to be memorably rewarding. If the flower is just sort of efficiently pushing the bee, the bees buttons and saying, OK, forge at me, then all flowers would converge and look the same. Right. But of course, that can help the flower. The flower wants to take its pollen to another individual, of the same species. Right. So flowers are beautiful because bees are making choices. So that either means that it doesn't take a lot of cognitive power or we're really underestimating uh, uh, the cognitive ability of bees. And I think it might be the latter. I mean, recently there was this great uh, example where uh, they gave a, a, a reward to a bumblebee when he rolled a, a marble into a, a, a hole within a, a, sort of a, a large chessboard. And and, uh, uh, and, and and so these the, it was like soccer, you know, like the bumblebees playing soccer, basically. And they were really, really good at it. Right? And it was like a cognitive task. In there. So anyway, we've gone far from birds, but here you go. <laughs> but it, it is fascinating. And I think that like that is it something I wonder if it's something about social species that tend to also develop these because you, you see, you know, in humans and birds and bees, it tends to be the ones that sort of like there's Absolutely. a there's a communal processing ability maybe that aids in that Absolutely. as soon as soon as soon as you have social relationships uh then you have the opportunity for social choices mm. and some criteria on which you make those choices which are always going to be something you perceive right and and um and those uh, and that's what's one of the interesting about 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 sex is that it always provides the opportunity. Well, it's a, it's a both a competitive and a, and a collaborative or cooperative venture. Now, every organism is, is uh, you know, automatically right at the beginning having its fitness uh, by being sexual. So because, you know, you're, you're, you're only going to be donating half of your genes to the next generation. So that means you really got to cooperate, right? You're, <laughs> uh, and, and yet there's also competitive elements, right? And so as a result, this, uh, uh, um, uh, sexual choice is this fundamental opportunity that gives rise to a lot of ornament in nature. Can you talk a little bit about, because I, I wanted to put this in the song that I'm putting out, but I, I totally didn't have the space, and also it's a very visual thing, so we'll see if you can explain it. 
Um, but the evolution of feathers um, is something that is very hard to visualize and figure out how this very complicated structure comes out of a scale or a hair or anything like that. Do you, have yeah. a, do you have a good way that you like to explain that? Well, you know, I mean, I can only set up the problem. Okay. And, and, the, and, the, and the problem is the, is the following, you know, um, uh, feathers are, are branched uh, like a tree, right? But they grow from their base like a hair. So, if, you know, you look at your hair, the, the, the tip of your hair is, is the oldest part and the base of the hair is the youngest, right? Right. right so, so, so and, but you look at a tree and the youngest part is the tips of the branches, huh. right? And the branches are formed by, by, uh, by the meristem branching, you know, bifurcating at mm. the tip or at some, at some joint, right? Yeah. And so what that means is that in a feather, the, the branches are older than the nodes and their interconnections, Right. And so that's the big conundrum. So how does a feather do that? Right. Well, the real answer is that it's one of these like, miraculously great, awesome things about vertebrate biology. Uh, it happens to be done in a tube. And uh, so uh, feathers are like uh, ZD pasta, you know, being extruded by the skin. Right? <laughs> tube of epidermis with dermis in the middle, right? And, uh, and basically you orchestrate move uh, growth in that tube to create this 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 pattern of differentiated branches fusing uh, at the end, and uh, besides that, you definitely got to go to like visuals. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll try to link in the description to uh, I, 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 your we, lecture because you had a, you had a great a visual great, for that. We have a great we have a great little animation uh, that I can send you. Mm -hmm. But I also definitely found it a challenge to try to explain that animation in any form of lyrics as well. So <laughs> ended up ended up being left out. The other thing that I found really fascinating when I was researching bird evolution. And this was like the whole no notion of uh, pedamorphosis is new to me. Um, this idea that, th that a, a creature is sort of, it's a four-dimensional creature as opposed to a three-dimensional creature. And you can get a lot of, of diversity just by moving around the pieces in time, sort of like taking, taking adult features and mixing them with um, baby features. Um, yeah. Could you? It, it, indeed, you know, um... Uh, the, the the work on the evolution of feathers is really a great example of uh, of, a, of an exciting field of evo devo or evolution and development, uh, and in and this area really focuses not just on genetic variations that become successful in a population, but on the on the additional fact that um, every organism that has a morphology has to grow into that shape. It has to grow itself, right? Mm. And um, and this process creates all kinds of uh, barriers to the possible. So mutation is random with respect to need, but the mutations that are right are not random with respect to the organism. There's lots of things that you just can't do, you know. Um, and so if you build a body that has, you know, a, a limbs with one bone, a pair of bones, and then a lot of bones, right? That that means that any kind of variation in limb morphology it's going to be based on this certain constraint, this certain history. Hmm. And, and the body is filled with these kind of features. And we're learning a lot about both the genes that are involved in, in the development of the organism uh, and in the process it gives rise to innovation. So a lot of times when you have innovations, totally new stuff, it comes as a result of a new way to, to uh, circumvent or evade the constraints placed by, uh, by development itself. Right. And so what what bird feathers did was invent the tube. And once you got a tube, a tube of epidermis growing out of the skin, then you have a whole set of new opportunities for innovation. And, and it's actually a lot like once animals, you know, if you look at a jellyfish, it's basically a bag. Right. It's got only one opening. It's going like this. But as soon as you get the tubular organism with a mouth and an anus and a top and a bottom and a left and a right and a, and a front and, a, and an end, you know, you get an explosion in animal diversity, right? So as soon as you create something as complicated as a tube, uh, you could do different things on your top and your bottom and all around and in and out, and you have just dimensions of anatomy to work with. And that's what feathers did. So feathers made the tube, and then kaboom, uh, you get this most complicated thing that grows out of the skin of any animal. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's really about uh, uh, you know uh, the way in which development itself 
creates biases in how evolution can proceed and, and gives rise to, you know, the diversity we see around us. Right. So it opens you up to this entirely new sort of set of parameter space that you can right. You can and it, and it, shows, then. It, shows, it shows something about the limitation of uh, of the population genetic popular, uh, uh, you know, 20th century synthesis in evolutionary biology hmm. made a huge amount of progress, but it's still incomplete. And so uh, there are lots of areas of biology are trying to fill in those gaps currently. So what are you working on now? Like, what's your, what's your current, what's that question that's driving you forward now that you want to get the answer to? Well, since about 2005, uh, I've been working in collaborations on, 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 on duck sex, okay. which is a, a topic that I never thought I would get into. Uh, but it turns out that duck sex, uh, a lot of duck sex is, you know, normal. Uh, 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 we, vanilla in the bird world, you know, it's a pair. Uh, the fe- male goes quack, quack, quack and has the green head. The female chooses the male. But then um, in many species of duck, there's also a lot of uh, sexual violence, hmm. uh, uh, sexual coercion, right? And, and forced copulation. And, and this, uh, so uh, duck sex has this, uh, you know, violent aspect to it. Um, but what we've uh, realized or discovered uh, with Patty Brennan now at uh, Mount Holyoke uh, College and, 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 and collaborators, is that um, freedom of choice matters to animals. Hmm. Um, and I mean that, you know, sexual autonomy, the idea that there is some, uh, some special aspect of getting what you want and not being coerced, uh, actually matters to animals and evolves. So this is kind of like a feminist discovery in the heart of evolutionary biology that comes out of ornithology and uh, totally unexpected to me personally. Uh, and so one of the things we're doing now is working on mathematical population genetic theory to demonstrate that this is plausible. So my student Sam Snow and other collaborators are doing uh, 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 explicit math models to, to demonstrate that this process is possible. Hmm. So how does how does freedom of the whole big thing we could go to <laughs> also needs pictures? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose so. Um, so what's what's that mechanism then? Like how does how does freedom of choice come to be evolutionarily favorable? Okay, so if a female uh, gets the mate she prefers, uh, then her offspring inherit the green head and the quack 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 that she likes, and that uh, other females have also evolved to prefer. Okay there's a kind of this normative desire that will coalesce within a bird species. Hmm. So if she's forcibly fertilized by, or she's uh, fertilized by force, by forced copulation or by sexual violence, then her offspring will either inherit a random set of ornaments that she hasn't preferred or a set of ornaments that she has actually rejected. And that means that her offspring will not be as sexually attractive as they would have been had she gotten her choice. Right. What that means is that any kind of behavior, or in the duck uh, uh, sex uh, example, a uh, 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 vaginal morphology, uh, that allows them to uh, um, uh, to assert their uh, desires will actually evolve. Hmm. So what happens in 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 in, in ducks is that the males uh, still have a penis. Most birds have lost theirs but it's homologous with the, the mammalian penis. And these birds have uh, uh, still have this structure and they can force copulations using it. But what happens in, in, uh, in females is that they've evolved or co-evolved uh, vaginal morphologies that prevent intromission or fertilization during forced copulation. So it's literally an anti-screw device because the male, uh, the male uh, penis is counterclockwise coiled and the and the female vagina is clockwise coiled so it's like a uh you know uh, a, a a chiral uh, uh mismatch that comes only in limericks and ducks and and so that 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 um that mismatch how does that evolve well vaginal morphologies that allow females to maintain their choices uh give them the direct benefits of having sons that other females will like uh and so it's the normative desires the fact that uh, females as a group um, in solidarity agree on what is attractive that allows them to leverage their autonomy, to advance their autonomy in the face of sexual violence. So these ducks have uh, uh, are 98% successful at preventing 
fertilization by forced copulation. Even when uh, forced, copulation, forced copulations are 40 to 50% of the actual sexual behavior in the wild. So that's like an FDA approvable birth control method. And, and they have evolved. And the question is how? And so we're uh, working, uh, we've done a lot of work on the, on, the, on the anatomy and the evolution. And now we're doing work on the population genetic uh, theory to demonstrate that this, uh, this model I articulated can actually result in the evolution of new methods, new mechanisms of the resi to resist uh, uh, sexual violence. So that's you know, pretty radical. You're, you're just a bird watcher. You go through that and all of a sudden you're, you're <laughs> on, uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a, a direct connection between feminism and evolutionary biology. These are fields that are mostly antagonistic for a lot of reasons because evolutionary biologists have, uh, 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 well, I think they've been uh, shoveling a lot of uh, BS <laughs> <laughs> about, uh, about uh, uh, in the form of, uh, you know, evolutionary psychology theories about the adaptation of human behavior. Right. I think that that's actually that feels like a great example of how hard it is to figure out like I'm just I'm trying to imagine what happened what happens in say 10 million 10 million years suppose that ducks evolve a higher brain function and start analyzing themselves and trying to figure out like why are we built this way what kind of designer designed this specific morphology for us that literally prevents us from you know mating properly um and you would have to go back to these these very specific things about your 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 genetics and your your environment ten million years ago to figure it out. And I well, one one thing that happens is not all ducks do it. And basically, what happens is when you have a high concentration of resources, lots of social opportunity, then uh, then then it's more likely to happen. But a swan or a goose tends to be very rare. Uh, wood duck, very rare. Harlequin duck, rare. Mm -hmm. You know, puddle ducks that you see in the, in the city park, uh, very common. Are there other, like, social dynamics things among birds that you think can be more or less applied to people? Um, well, yeah. And, 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 and one of the things, well, the, the issue in, in the, in the um, well, it, of course, applying any of this to people requires a lot of caveats yeah, and a lot of, of but, you know, what is it about, people? you know, that we're talking about? Because people have an incredible social complexity and cultural complexity that is uh, uh, either absent or a lot simpler in birds. Mm -hmm. But another thing that we're really interested in is another example of sexual autonomy is in the bowerbirds. Bowerbirds are these amazing uh, Australian and Papua New Guinean species that build uh, where the, ma the female does all the parental care. She builds the nest, lays the eggs and raises the babies. But... She visits males who do these elaborate displays, and the males make a, 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 a bower, which is not a nest at all, but it's made out of sticks, and it's a, it's, a, it's a display construction. It's kind of like a seduction theater, if you will, and it's made with sticks. There's, some of them are avenues right, with a little passageway, and some of them are like look like a tree, uh, like a Charlie Brown Christmas tree with a, with a sort of a, a ramp around the base, right? And... Um, um, so there's a large literature on them, and uh, we're interested in studying how they evolve. And one of the ways they apparently do evolve is that the um, the bower evolves from female preference. Uh, the males who make the most attractive bowers get the most mates. So it's really the females are agents in the evolution of the bower. Mm. And the bower is clearly aesthetic. It has a lot of beautiful elements, and they collect materials. But the bower also um, has another function. Uh, imagine it, the avenue bower. What happens is the female sitting right in the middle and the male's displaying in the front. Well, if he wants to copulate, he has to go around the back, which gives the female a chance to pop out the front. Hmm. So the bower is an aesthetic setting for courtship where the female gets literally inches away from the male, but she also entirely maintains her freedom of choice. Hmm. She can evade his advances. So she is basically a uh, um, uh, protected from s uh, sexual coercion uh, uh, or the, the, the bowerbird equivalent of date rape, right? <laughs> she can get as close as she wants uh, and still maintain her freedom of choice. And, uh, and we, so we think that's a, a different way that uh, autonomy can evolve from, because in the, in the ducks, 
the penis gets bigger and the vagina gets more complicated and on and on and on. It keeps going, right? It's kind of an arms race. Right. But, in, but in the bowerbird, uh, the females take apart male uh, uh, advantage in a way that allows them to get what they want. And what do the females do with also all this autonomy? They make choices. And, and so what happens as a result of this is an explosion of beauty. Uh, mm -hmm. Bowerbirds have this explosive diversity, all these different structures, all the different stuff they gather. Um, and so it has this other feedback on, on beauty itself. So bowerbirds are, are, it's like a date, it's more of a date model. Yeah, it's like yeah. you, you yeah, go but, out to the but, restaurant but, and you have a safe place to get really close and hang out and not have to worry about you know, anything because you're, you're in a safe location. Right. And also, but it also speaks to the notion that female or mating preferences uh, are not just about getting what you want. They can also evolve to ensure that you get what you want. Hmm. Right. And, and so that's this, uh, and that's this new, uh, a new theory, a new, a new element in, in, in sexual selection that I think is actually quite, quite, quite relevant to, to, to human evolution. So if, uh, if someone wants to get into what you're doing now, like if, so, if, if, there's a, if there's a kid out there who's interested in birds, um, how would you recommend that they get started? Well, uh, funny you should ask, because I have a book coming out. Oh, snap. In, 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 I feel like in, you've done in, a few in, of these in interviews. In a little over a month, <laughs> day nine, and it's called The Evolution of Beauty. Uh, how Darwin's forgotten theory of mate choice shapes the animal world and us. And uh, so this is uh, really a, a recruitment document. It's exactly for, uh, you know, that girl bird watcher in Wyoming or that guy that's gotten into birds in Texas and is wondering what sort of science is available out there, right? Um and it's, uh, you know, we didn't talk about it, but my ideas about aesthetic evolution are not that popular in, in evolutionary biology. Mm. Most people would prefer to explain away beauty as not really beautiful, but all about getting better. You know, that's, uh, you get the males, the females getting good genes, or she's getting more, be better worms, or no sexually transmitted diseases, right? And I really think that most of the time, uh, birds are just getting what they want, that they're actually agents, aesthetic agents in their own evolution. So, you know, creating scientific change is hard. Um, uh, and, but we have some pretty good examples. And, and, and so one of them is sort of phylogenetics, getting phylogeny back into evolutionary biology. I've been in, observed that. Uh, getting people to understand that birds are dinosaurs and discovering it. Hey, that's a lot of uh, intellectual change. So uh, evolution of beauty is like another front in trying to create intellectual change. And a lot of that occurs through recruitment of new people. So right now, evolutionary biology has several generations of people that came into it uh, because uh, they read Richard Dawkins' a Selfish Gene. Right. Right. And, and, and that's a great thing. Uh, but we need some more diverse and different kinds of people in evolutionary biology. And, and so that's why I wrote The Evolution of Beauty. Because <laughs> I'm hoping, I'm hoping to, into that, uh, that people go into evolutionary biology because uh, they want to understand beauty. Hmm. Yeah, the, uh, like sexual selection as a whole is so fascinating to me because it's almost... In a weird way, or at least in an unconscious way, it's almost as if like the intelligent design people that we love to rail on are like a little bit right. Like we are designed by mind, but we're designed by our own minds over evolutionary history. Yeah, yeah, amen. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I back back in, in one of my early one of my early bird feather papers, I actually wrote that uh, that. Uh, for most of the 20th century, the creationist critiques of the adaptationist theory or the aerodynamic theory of the evolution of feathers were actually right. Huh. Uh, you know, in other words, uh, there were no intermediates. You know, they took apart this, uh, this, this, this notion that birds had elongate scales that got longer and longer and longer and then caught air and then flew, you know, which turned out to be totally false. 
uh, and, and, and the creationist uh, critique of that argument was actually correct. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean that creation is correct. Uh, the alternative wasn't that, oh, therefore, it must have been specially created. Um, uh, but indeed, um, to their discredit, I think evolutionary biologists have been struggling to avoid the reality of animal mind. And in particular, the subjective experiences of animals. There is something it is like to be a female uh, peafowl looking at a peacock and, and, and liking it or not liking it and making a choice. And that, that, that agency, that ability to make choices, uh, sexual choices based on what you like has driven a huge amount of diversity in the natural world. And we're trying to explain it away rather than admit it and explain it. And so that's what the book is really about. Uh, and, and, um, and that's an, you know, sort of an exciting thing that's going on right now in the, in, in, in the lab. That's really cool. And I think more generally that speaks to the fact that wherever you are, even if you think you've got the most objective science, you really want to avoid the echo chamber phenomenon where you don't have, like if the only people out on the fringes are very kooky people with ideas that are factually wrong, you still need those people because often they'll poke little holes in what you're doing. <laughs> well, in, in, indeed, uh, you know, um, in science, we're, we're, we're interested in, 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 in practical theories that work. But uh, we often think that that means we should narrow down to just one current theory, right? Mm. But in fact, in order to be a healthy discipline, we need at least some pluralism. That doesn't mean, you know, uh, everything, anything goes. You know, obviously, a lot of ideas are, yeah. are, are, are ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> but it does mean that the party line has a real danger. Dogmatic adherence, like, this is the way, uh, you know, uh, matter works. And then suddenly you got people that are on the fringes talking about dark matter or dark energy. And suddenly they go, oops, you know. It turns out we're only describing 5% of the mass of the universe, you know, but maybe that's the 5% we care about, but still we don't have a complete theory, right? Yeah. And so, so, so we got, you got to have, uh, you got to have pluralism. You got to have some opening for diversity of thought in order to get a healthy science. So how do you, do you have any ways that you try to avoid that too? Because people always talk about in science, how you're supposed to be constantly trying to disprove yourself, but it's very hard to get outside of your own perspective and your own pet theory in order to do that. And you see time and time again that people who are trying, even people who are trying to actively disprove themselves end up narrowing their vision to the things that they see that confirm what they believe. So like, do you have any thoughts on how you go about um, protecting yourself from that? Or is it, does it just take other people? Well, you know, that one of my, one of my, I think a lot of it has to do with style of mind. You know, what kind of thoughts and thought processes really make you go, right? Hmm. We have these amazing tools uh, and, and, and more and more uh, 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 technological capacity to, to investigate and inquire about the world, right? So you're, the question is, you know, how do we use them well? And, and I think that um, one of the best analogies comes from uh, a, a, an essay by uh, 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 Isaiah Berlin in the mid 20th century. And he wrote a book uh, called The Hedgehog and the Fox. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's actually an analysis of the, of the, of the career of Tolstoy. <laughs> but it, he, he takes up an old Greek uh, uh, myth, or old Greek of aphorism, where the guy said, uh, um, you know, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one great thing. Of course, a hedgehog is, a, is an animal with, covered with prickles, right? And uh, when it has a problem, it just rolls up in a ball. Mm. And, and, uh, and, and he, Berlin, analyzed this as a kind of analogy for, for, for intellectual style, right? And, in, you know, and hedgehogs are people that burrow down into one, one dimension, right? Really, really, really controlling for everything and making uh, uh, progress. Mm. And foxes are are, uh, uh, you know, attracted to baubles and new things, and they're diverse. They're sometimes disloyal. They'll do one thing and then a totally other thing, right? And, uh, you know, to be healthy, science needs both foxes and hedgehogs. 
But the science you're describing is mostly hedgehog science, <laughs> right? And so one way to avoid, um, uh, you know, groupthink is to be a fox, hmm. right? And to wheel around on the question and ask it from a totally different way, right? And, and the fox has problems. One, it's a lot easier to tell the quality of hedgehog research, right? Because it goes along for decades. It's like, well, why did they do that? Well, they did it because this experiment said that. And then they did this because that experiment said this. But you're moving forward. The, the fox is, looks like crazy, right? It's all, all doing different stuff, right? Um, but we need a lot more foxes in science, right? And they're the ones that will wheel around and, and disrupt the current uh, thought and bring in something new. Right. And so I think if you're a scientist and you just say, well, I got to have some foxes in my lab, or I got I got to be re- hanging out with some foxes uh, to make sure that my hedgehog tendencies, which are great, don't become a problem for me. Right. Yeah. You need you need those people who are willing to go out into the, the fringes of the unknown and maybe fail catastrophically. And it's sort well, maybe, of a, not, maybe, not, maybe not fringes. <laughs> well, it's, it, you don't want to fail catastrophically at, at, at too young an age because, right. <laughs> you know, there's a weeding out process. You want, to, you want to stay in the game. You want to stay in the profession, right? Yeah. So you can't get too crazy too early. But indeed, um, yes, you have to, you have to uh, uh, seek out opportunities for at least local disruption in how you're, how you're thinking about a problem or, or just pick up wholly new problems, right? <laughs> Yeah. But right now, right now I'm doing I'm doing collaborations with people in uh in uh you know physics, applied physics, mechanical, chemical engineering, uh economics, uh, uh organic chemistry, uh and even in uh the humanities, right? And 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 so for me, uh one one way I really like to do it is uh is to to bring new people that don't think about birds to to relate to birds, <laughs> relate <laughs> people to to uh, smart folks who get interested in birds. That's a that's a good way to do it. That's a that's a great. I, I feel like maybe there's something in 21st century science that's leaning towards that with the fact that everyone's more networked. That if we have, if we have the ability to, and we make the choice to, we can actually all of a sudden connect all of these fields that for decades have been operating on this sort of, you know, do a PhD and focus in and know more and more about less and less until you know everything about nothing. Um, get, get it <laughs> well, into... The, 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 the interesting thing is that um, in order to have uh, interdisciplinarity, though, you, you really need disciplinarity, yeah. right? Unless, unless there's an engineering school with a mechanical engineer uh, and, and a school that also has uh, an evolutionary biologist interested in birds, you're not going to get those two people together. Mm. If they're at separate institutes or we don't have departments at all and we just say, what's the most exciting thing? Uh, you know, what's the chance you're going to hire a bird person? You know, almost <laughs> none, right? <laughs> you, know, you know, it's only by saying, oh, we want to have different kinds of things that represent the different disciplines that we're going to have this. So it's, a, it's an interaction. How you, uh, uh, how you make sure that people get out of their buildings and start to connect with others and have other intellectual interests, um, uh, you know, that's, that's a challenge. I do it now because I'm addicted to it. <laughs> I know there are smart people out there that can help me understand birds better. And so my job is to go find them and somehow bring them into relation with ornithology. So you're, you're internally motivated. You're, for you, it's, it's just that birds are intrinsically fascinating. Eh? Yeah, I, I, I never try to justify it. It might as well be, it might as well be ballet or you know, anything else. It is, it is purely for its own sake. And yet, some of the work we're doing is, uh, you know, in the in bird uh, structural color, bird feathers, blue bird feathers. We've done a lot of work on the physics of blue bird feathers. It turns out that there are a couple labs in the world now working on the next kind of color Kindle, like electronic paper. Okay. They're using biomimetic approaches based on the discoveries we've made in the physics of blue bird feathers. Okay. So nobody would have expected anything like that could ever really arise. And I didn't, I just wanted to know how bird, blue bird feathers work, right? And, and how birds grow them. And uh, uh, so this kind of unexpected stuff keeps, uh, keeps arising. So uh, uh, it it's, uh, makes you excited to go to the office. <laughs>
Yeah, that, I think that's a, that's a scientific universal in a lot of ways. Like quantum mechanics was like that. We have computers now. Who'd have thunk? Or, uh, you know, this CRISPR revolution, right? Is people who are really interested in how to make better bacteria to make yogurt for in, an industrial plant. And they stumble on this incredible discovery. Or even more fundamentally, how does the how does the bacteria deal have an immune system? Yeah, you know, it, it, within a cell, right? And it's like, well, it does this this sort of this sort of business. Wow, we could actually use that in a practical way. It's a uh, it's a uh, yeah, there's a lot of unexpectedness, and that's why uh, you know having disciplinary diversity will create those opportunities for interdisciplinary uh, uh, advance. That's really great. I'm, I'm conscious of your time. I know you said you had to uh, take off at 11. Um, so thank you so much for coming on. Um, this has been a, a fascinating conversation. And I want to give you, I guess, the last word, if there's anything you'd really like people to know that we haven't got to do in this conversation. Well, uh, first of all, it's been a really great pleasure to be here. Uh, I have really enjoyed learning about your work. <laughs> Uh, I thought Exoplanets was a fantastic, uh, 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 fantastic one. Pluto, CRISPR, Cas9, it, 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 your, your work is awesome. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the, the Bird Origins uh, uh, video. Um, uh, again, you know, uh, I don't think you have to have grown up thinking that birds are the most important thing in the world uh, to relate to this story about scientific discovery. And uh, it's just one example of all the kinds of things that are available in, in science and in the realm of evolutionary biology uh, that make it a really fascinating thing to, to study. So thanks for your interest. <laughs>